Yama, hello, welcome. Woman Jekka, to come here with purpose today. I'd like to say thank you for, all, for joining us here today as we are here for National Reconciliation Week 2023. Be a voice for generations as we discuss the implications of the university's truth-telling project. We are gathered on the unceded lands of the Wandri, oh, sorry, we are gathered on the lands and acknowledge the Wurrung people, the Wurundjeri people, and all the other locations in which our campus is upon. We have our Bunurong people, the Banarong people, the Jadarong, and the Yoda Yoda people in which we are connected to. We acknowledge the First Nations as our first artists, creators, researchers, and scientists of this land. And we pay our respects to our elders past, present, and thank them for their guidance and support and the self-determination that connects us to this country today. While nationally we are holding events to celebrate our Indigenous culture, our rivers are being poisoned, our sacred sites are being demolished, and our ve and very ecosystems, entire ecosystems, are being destroyed. We here at the University of Melbourne are we are in a very privileged position, and we must constantly question what we are supporting and how we can further change. I'm Rebecca Quinn, a proud Aboriginal warrior from Luchawita, Tasmania. I also have a settler's heritage as well, which I'd like to acknowledge. So I sit in that middle of this gap that we talk about, that healing grey space. When I was young, growing up, there was a lot of turmoil and a lot of distrust around identity and a lot of bureaucracy. So my elders sent me off on a healing journey and that's what has led me here today as a truth seeker and a light bearer to this space. I'm the co-chair of the Indigenous Melbourne Reconciliation Network, where we play a critical role as critical friends as the university journeys from, indigenous, from our reconciliation action plan to our Indigenous strategy. Many view the term reconciliation as an outdated government initiative with the debate that two sides cannot reconcile what was not once was. How might we reconcile with a colony that hasn't reconciled with itself? What we do know is that it's about learning to stand together in the discomfort and celebrate our differences to reconcile our shared history. Pausing, deep listening and making time to just be. It's been said that the university is not a safe space for Indigenous people and that systemic change is too big of an ambitious. However, if we look around, if we can't create change in an environment that is for sharing, for knowledge and for learning, then where can we turn to? This is why it's an absolute honour to be here today, to have this conversation of sharing the challenges of our Indigenous history at the University of Melbourne. And I'd like to continue Rebecca's acknowledgement of country by acknowledging the countries of those who join us via Zoom, whether on Nam or from across Australia. Wherever we are, we are on country, on unceded, powerful, as we saw last night, for those of you that felt the earthquake, and beautiful country. And I pay my deep respects to Inala and to Barry and to Becca to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past and present, and to all First Nations people who join with us today. I commit to respecting Indigenous cultural knowledges, creative practices and diplomacies in my work and within my communities. I further commit to being present and vulnerable and to allyship as we progress truth-telling this afternoon. As co-chair, non-Indigenous, of the University of Melbourne's Reconciliation Network, as artist, educator and material culture scholar from Scottish settler descent, as acting head of school of the Melbourne School of Professional and Continuing Education, and as academic director of Curriculum and Transformation, there's going to be an exam on that later, mm -hmm. I humbly work together with Rebecca to chair this important conversation today Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We'd now like to introduce you to Margot Eden. 
Margot is Director of Indigenous Strategy, who will provide a brief overview of why we're here today, the Indigenous History of the University Project. Thanks, Margot. Thank you, Melissa and uh, Rebecca, and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. So we're here today to discuss Gumbak Gugwana, the University of Melbourne and Indigenous Australia, which is a history of the university's interactions with Indigenous Australians since its foundation in 1853. The words Dumbak Gubguana were gifted to us by the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation and mean truth telling. This uh, history will be published by Melbourne University Publishing and available later this year and early next year. This is an historical work divided into two volumes. The first, titled Truth, confronts the troubling, at times very distressing, histories of racism. The second, titled Voice, explores the important contributions that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have made to the university. More than 80 individuals have contributed to this Indigenous-led initiative to date. Sections of the book, book grapple with the university's physical premises and resources, scientific racism, collections including human remains, and the rising utility of Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous partnerships. The books are a major output of a broader University Truth and Justice project which commenced in 2021 and which now will be given prominence and progress through a signature project in our new Indigenous strategy, Murmuk Jering, uh, Woi Wurrung words meaning working together, which will be launched in the coming months. The information in these books will additionally be used to develop podcast series and training programs and the project team will work with faculties to scope and develop teaching and learning materials to inform curriculum. The material in the books will be supplemented by information to be housed on a website, including the stories of the broader University Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander student and staff population, and to promote ongoing critical engagement with this history. The university will also establish a truth-telling and dialogue centre, which would work with academic divisions, our libraries, museums and collection staff, our Indigenous partners, Indigenous communities and other institutions to ensure the problematic history of the university's engagement with Indigenous peoples is acknowledged, explored and appreciated. The centre will also support research and teaching and learning and provide access to historical records in a respectful and culturally safe way. The theme of this year's National Reconciliation Week is Be a Voice for Generations. And this project and the publication to be discussed by the panel aims to give voice to stories that have not always been told and perhaps do not fit within the university's vision of itself. So I'll now hand you back to uh, Melissa and Rebecca to introduce today's panel. Thank you. Thank you, Margot. As you can see, it is challenging to do truth telling. And it is great to be here in this moment, to be joined by our panellists who bring a diversity of perspectives and experiences to today's discussion. First, I'd like to introduce Anala Cooper, a Yaru woman from Broome in Kimberleys in Western Australia. Anala is the, currently the director of Murat Barak, the Melbourne Institute for Indigenous Development here at the university. She has a Bachelor of Arts and a Master's in Human Rights Law and as long has been an advocate for Indigenous rights and social justice. Anala is a regular contributor to the ABC News Breakfast and The Drum, and is the director of the board of the Adam Briggs Foundation and State Library, Victoria. Thank you, Anala. Next, Professor Barry Judd, Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous, director of the Indigenous Studies Program at the School of Cultural and Communications here at the University of Melbourne. His area of research expertise relates to Australian race relations in Australian sports and interdisciplinary research methods in Indigenous studies at the, and Australian history. Barry has supported Indigenous activities in Australia higher education for over 30 years in both professional and academic roles. Barry is a descendant of the Pichajara people of Northern South Australia. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ross Jones. Dr. Ross Jones is a senior research fellow and lead editor of the Indigenous History of the University of Melbourne project in the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education. 
Ross's research interests and publications range across medical and education eugenics in Australia and the US and UK, the history of human anatomy, anthropology and race theory, the development of public education and medical biography and public health policies. And James, Dr. James Waghorn, uh, is the university historian based in the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education at the University. He's published on the role of students in shaping university cultures and on the relationship between universities and professional associations, as well as on lobby groups and professional and community organisations. James is an investigator on expert nation and universities and post-war recovery research projects, tracing the careers of university graduate graduates who served in the First and Second World Wars, funded by the Australian Research Council. Please join us in welcoming our panellists. <laughs> Wonderful. So we've prepared, prepared some uh, a question for each panel member and uh, have time for some audience questions toward the end. So start beginning to take notes as something to each your interest. Thank you. Uh, the first question is for Barry, and it's around um, before we begin to unpack uh, these quite risk stimulating histories of the university and its deeply embedded legacies. Uh, the first question speaks to cultural safety in the current aspect. As we attempt to build a more of a cultural safe environment at the University of Melbourne, how are culturally unsafe matters currently reported on? And who determines what is culturally safe or not? Um in an attempt to answer this question, I'm going to uh, go back in history, given that this is a panel on truth telling and historical matters to uh, when I first started work at the university, which I believe was um, probably December of 1989. Uh, so I was um, part of a program called the Curry Cadetship Scheme. Uh, which was aimed at young Aboriginal people studying undergraduate degree level programs. And um, at that time, the university, if you were successful, offered full-time employment to people. And uh, I turned up at the university uh, at that time. And uh, my first uh, place of work was an office in the Baldwin Spencer building. Um, and uh, my... Uh, Aboriginal family, of course, uh, come from Central Australia. And, um, you know, one of the few things I actually knew about the University of Melbourne was that Baldwin Spencer uh, had done work in Central Australia during the late 19th and early 20th centuries and had uh, collected or stolen all this stuff uh, from people. And, uh, you know, here I was turning up uh, to work um, in a building named uh, for him. Uh, there was no discussion about um, what that meant to me or how I felt about it. Um, and uh, those questions uh, or that recognition and those insights into um, how I might have felt uh, just didn't exist. Uh, that was at a time in the university's history when uh, the Indigenous activity uh, was very light on and uh, it was a time before we actually had uh, strategic uh, initiatives in the area. So there were no RAPs, uh, there were no university strategic plans, uh, there were, um, you know, reports to the Commonwealth about uh, student numbers and, and matters of that nature. Uh, and that was it. And uh, really, the Indigenous activity was seen as a bit of a compliance matter, to be honest, in terms of uh, how we went about things. Uh, I'm happy to say that the situation's uh, completely different now. And I think um, when we're talking about the history of the university, we shouldn't forget the great progress that's been made really starting in the 1970s through to the present time uh, by many, many people, too many to, to name. But uh, things have changed for the better 
And this place is a much safer place for Indigenous people to be. And we can see that through the increase in students and staff. I, I think the, the key thing when we think about cultural safety and how we achieve, achieve that, uh, for me, it, it always comes back to acts of recognition. Um, recognition that there, there are or there might be Indigenous people in the room, but more importantly than that, an act of recognition that our campuses, wherever they are, sit on unceded Aboriginal territory. Um, so at a very basic level, I think, uh, the most important act of recognition is not about people at all, it's about country. Uh, and this university, uh, by recognising that we sit on uh, country, um, that's a really uh, giant leap forward in my view because it um, reconfigures um, how the institution is placed in the globe. Uh, when I started here, uh, I think it's fair to say that um, the university saw itself as a derivative Cambridge or Oxford, um, and that's changing significantly as people uh, who work here uh, realise that we are an Australian university um, and that uh, because of our geographic location in the world, uh, we have unique things to offer the globe and uh, much of that, I think, uh, stems from our closeness to Indigenous people and communities who represent the oldest continuous uh, cultures anywhere in the world. And um, that's why today we're, you know, we're talking about the place of Indigenous knowledges in our um, advancing students and education strategy. Uh, that's why we have an Indigenous Knowledges Institute. Um, and that's why uh, we have the project that we're here to talk about today, which is um, going back to the 1850s and recognising that um, despite a long period of denial, uh, the university always has had a relationship with Indigenous people, um, whether that's been good, bad or indifferent. Um, that's up to the historians to tell us, but the relationship has existed be simply because our campuses are built on unceded uh, country of Indigenous groups. Um, the, I've been going on, I knew this would happen, but um, your questions about cultural safety, um, I wonder if it's uh, better to consider um, things not in terms of cultural safety, but cultural responsibility. Uh, too often, um, the responsibility for these things uh, falls on Indigenous people. And uh, although this university does have a significant Indigenous staff, um, it's still a pretty big organisation and uh, Indigenous people can't uh, do all the work alone. Um, so I think uh, perhaps uh, tweaking uh, the language of cultural safety to cultural responsibility might uh, provide people with some new insights about what they can do um, as the allies and um, supporters of Indigenous people. Beautiful. So do we have a robust cultural safety reporting line at the moment? And who determines what is culturally safe here? Uh, well, I, I guess um, uh, who determines what is cultural, uh, culturally safe? I think it comes back to individuals, doesn't it? Um, we, um, we need to listen and uh, recognise uh, how... Uh, people are placed within the organisation and if things are making them feel unsafe or marginal or not listened to, um, we need to have conversations uh, with people and uh, work through those things. Uh, like every organisation in Australia and around the world, um, you know, it's a, it's a daily uh, it's a daily 
piece of work that's forever in progress to get these things right. Um, we don't always get things right, but you know, I'm I'm fairly uh, confident and positive that uh, where the university is sitting today in 2023 is um, significantly better than where it sat in 1989. And um, I'm encouraged by um, so many good non-Indigenous uh, colleagues around me who uh, take these matters seriously and are committed to, you know, doing the things that don't make the newspaper or even our internal staff communications each and every day, um, turning up to uh, work on these things as part of what they do as their core business. Yeah. Um, and that's a real change. Yeah. You're right. Thanks for highlighting that change, Barry, and the journey that you've been on with that. And you're right, this is all our responsibility to have these conversations. So thank you. Thank you. The next question is to Anala. I really admire your leadership of navigating um, the university for our Indigenous students. Just wanted to share Thank that you. with you. Um, I don't do it on my own. <laughs> of <laughs> course, you. you've got a great team. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the question is around uh, our students and how important is this truth-telling project to our Indigenous students? And can you talk about some of the issues that our Indigenous cohort are currently facing? Mm. Um, it is important because... Um, from the perspective, our perspective at Morat Barak, and I'm sure others share this perspective, the university is their space. Mm. And, um, you know, for many of us who have been to university and experienced life as a student, um, it's important to feel a level of comfort in taking up your space mm. and enjoying those years as an undergraduate, but at whatever level of your study. So, it is incredi incredibly important because we want our students to experience their university time uh, not in isolation as individuals or, or in isolation from the staff at the university. That includes professional and academic staff. That um, we are a university community and so communicating um, work like this is really important to students. Mm. Sometimes we hear from students, um, they might be feeling frustrated about uh, an issue in particular or confused or, or just not have the information. Mm. And when those um, conversations arise at Morat Barak or, or elsewhere, as soon as you tell a student, oh, there's a whole committee working on that or there's a whole working group that is addressing this very thing, then there's a level of, relaxation where they go oh but then the anger can come back again when they say why didn't anyone tell us why am I wasting all my energy being mad about this issue and the university hasn't told us that it's being addressed already so why are we organizing a rally and organizing a protest and a, and a you know um, when when no one told us it was happening already so the comms is really important and um, both in um, formalized ways and informal conversations which we try and have all the time at Morat Barak. Um, so yes, this project um, is vital to all of our um, student community, alumni and current students and future students um, because feeling connected to the place where you are and you know a lot of students have a heavy load and they're here a lot, um, feeling connected and for Indigenous students feeling that their institution is participating in truth-telling is mm. vital. Mm. Yeah, great. Because our students do carry this extra cultural load when they come into this space. Mm. Um, and how well do you feel resourced um, to, um, I think I've heard rumours that we're going to be doubling our target for uh, Indigenous students here at the university. Do you feel adequately resourced for that? And what does that look like for the students? Yeah, the university's target is 1,000 students um, by 2029. And currently we have 512 students. About 45% of those are undergraduates and about 55% are um, graduate students, including almost 70 PhD candidates, which is just brilliant. Um, and I mean, with the question of resources, there can always be more resources and it's important to always look at how efficient our 
administration and our processes are in terms of outreach and engagement. Um, but it's not only the job of Marat Barak. It's a it's a um, a target and an ambition that the entire university has signed up to, and in working with our colleagues in onshore recruitment and through all of our faculties and schools, we'll keep working toward meeting that target. Um, when that target was set, we didn't anticipate a global pandemic mm. and the shift that that has created in life in general, but also in how people um, rank their priorities, I suppose. Some, um, some people might feel they're more inclined to defer study or um, take breaks um, or do other combinations of engagement with further study. Mm. So I think our, our outreach and engagement at the moment is um, fairly well resourced because we don't do it by ourselves. We do it with onshore and with, with faculties and schools too and we'll continue to build those internal relationships so that we've got aligned um, narratives and we've got aligned approaches. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Amara. Oh, and just briefly mm. as well to say that when we are speaking with future students, who are still in secondary school, one of the really um, great things that happens is you often then end up speaking to somebody's nan or their dad or their older sibling who are also thinking of returning to study. Mm -hmm. So a school leaver who's on an ATAR pathway might also have family members um, who are wishing to come back to study as, as mature age students. So mm -hmm. that's um, a really significant part of how we shape our outreach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very important to build that community there. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you give us a bit of a sense as to where our students are at at the moment? There's a lot going on outside of these walls and this university. How are our students feeling and, and showing up? Mm. We've got a, a great diversity among our student cohort, which um, is mirrored in our entire mainstream um, student cohort, where many students enrol, they put their head down, they come to class and they work hard and get their degree. Um, some students, we see them every day. It's important for them to come in in the morning, touch base at Morat Barak, make a cuppa, and we see them all the time. Mm. So there's a diversity of um, engagement. There's a diversity of um, need, I suppose. Um, some people just want to connect every day or every week. Others, we might see them once a semester. Um, and, you know, with 70 PhD candidates, sometimes we might only um, communicate with them on the phone or in email. Mm. So we, um, we also have students who live at home, students that live in college. Um, so they're having, um, you know, a varying experience mm. of university life as well. Mm. It's important to acknowledge that for some of our students, living at college or living away from home might not be a viable option because they may have family or other cultural obligations mm -hmm. where they've got to stay at home. So in short, to say that um, there isn't one experience of Indigenous students at the university. Unfortunately, we do still have students who report um, experiencing and witnessing racism while they're on campus. Um, and we always firstly listen and then give the student the options of what they can do if they wish to make a complaint or, um, you know, that there's a process for listening and, re and reporting. Um, unfortunately, not many, not all students choose to go down the reporting road for a range mm -hmm. of reasons. But then other students, look, they may experience things like that and wish not to bring it up. Um, and other students don't report those mm -hmm. times, types of things. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's um, depending on the particular um, element of a student's experience that we're talking about, there's a whole range. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And it can be a little bit tricky to learn from these mistakes when we want to bypass them and hard to stay in that moment. So yeah. something that we should be looking at yeah. further. Thanks, Anala. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for those insights, Anala. Our next question is to Ross, um, and it concerns the challenges associated with truth-telling. Another easy question. Can you share some of the truth telling challenges of the Indigenous History Project to date and how these challenges are being addressed? <clears throat> Good question. Um, I'd, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, before I 
give all the problems um, are people who aren't here, and that's um, Marcia Langton, who's one of the co-editors, who's a great inspiration for us and a, and a, and a great, she, as you'll see, a great contributor to the book. And Uncle Jim Berg, who keeps me honest by ringing me up all the time and telling me to hurry up and what tell and I send him chapters and he rings back and gives advice and I'd like to acknowledge the committee too the indigenous committee so we have good oversight because the next question's a pretty the next point I'm going to make is a pretty hairy one is why is an old white man lead editor on a project like this and uh, meaning me and why is another white man the other editor on a project like this and that was the question we asked right at the beginning and Richard James, who was at the university, said to me, why should Indigenous scholars apologise to Indigenous Australia for their treatment by old white men at the university? We need an old white man, so you're it. Um, so that's, that's sort of get the monkey out of the room. But we're very conscious of that problem, James and I, with the project and, and um, Amargo as well. Um, and that's partly uh, influenced us in the way we've sort of set it up. So the first thing is um, who writes, who writes? That's a really important one. And we have put a lot of effort into get, having Indigenous voices into the project. And one reason um, that we have a second, vo two volumes, is that we, the second volume where we talk about Indigenous Australia's increasing and important role in the university, and sort of because it's a history, it's basically more post Second World War. Um, the second volume has a higher Indigenous um, number of scholars writing. So I think we're up to about, um, we're getting close to 35, 40% in the second volume. There are less, but not substantially less, but there are nearly 30% contributors in the first volume as well. So that's been our main issue, one of our main issues in writing and one of the difficulties about truth telling. Who's going to tell the truth? The other way we tried to tackle this problem was to not do a standard history of um, the university. When they asked me, I said, look, I read Indigenous history, I'm interested in it and, uh, and, it, in, 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 and it sort of affects my work to some degree. But really, I'm, my his, I'm a historian of eugenics and racism. And so I spoke, and James came in on the project very early and he's the university historian. So he's got a, a very tremendous knowledge of tertiary education and education and all that's associated with that. So we said, look, we two of us don't want to write this history um, and then Ma and we don't want to just have a number of people writing it. We want to have a lot of people writing it. So the, hence the nightmare of 80 plus authors that we have at the moment, which is not a nightmare, it's a lovely nightmare actually. <laughs> it's a dream um, because the stuff is fantastic. It really, the, the, the stuff that's coming out is quite shocking, some of it. Some of it you won't know. There's a lot of new shocking stuff coming out. Um, but we were just, as the project grew, we were just so excited to see how much was going on at the university in the Indigenous area now. And um, without being, you know, um, too sort of, you know, trying to sound too institutional, I mean, I think for all its faults, as Barry said, the institution has done a remarkably good job of solving many of the problems. And that isn't to say there aren't ongoing problems. There always will be. So that sort of, that's the answer, the, the two problems of who writes it and um, what do we write about. So just to conclude, we've got all these essays, you know, 80 plus essays. Um, we've tried to make it um, a, a good narrative. So there's introductions to each sections and we hope it reads well. And there's lots of illustrations and there's personal recollections. The book starts with a personal recollection of Uncle Jim Berg. Um, and, but we don't see it as a closed, even though it's going to be a published book, we don't see it as a closed publication or a project. Um, for that reason, particular, one of the, we um, argued very strongly with Melbourne U University Publishing for an open access um, editions, which there will be. There will be a free edition online of the book, the two books both of which are very large and which will be quite expensive, because partly because there's going to be a free version. So, but also we hope that there will be many outputs from this and that more and more Indigenous scholars will take over this role and uh, take over the project, basically, um, which we see that happening you know, as the, the number of scholars grows in the university. 
So I think that probably some, summarises pretty much. A difficult question. So I'm sure there are questions <laughs> and I'm ha ha happy to, yeah. Yes, so there's just questions. We can take some of those at the end. I'm just wondering, it seems to me that it's a, a rich um, space for next steps, for collaborations, for further research and so on. How does somebody who reads and is moved um, find outreach for next steps? How well, does that well, well, that's part of the planning for the next part of, you know, we don't have anything funded in concrete in place now. We, we've, we're collecting material. We, one thing I really would love to do is have an Indigenous biographical index of the university. So we have a list of all, all the Indigenous staff and students who came through the university. So that was one of my plans. And we're collecting little mini biographies of people and keeping them. Some can't make it into the book, so we're mm -hmm. so you know if anyone wants to write some people they know of who they think are really important, well, no, any anyone who made a contribution to the university and like mm -hmm. to send us them, and really you know we love getting emails from people. I, I'm genuinely really excited. We can't put everything in the book, but you know there, there hopefully there will be a place for all contributions. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many now. We, we you know there's just too many Indigenous staff and students. For everyone to get a say in the book, but mm -hmm. but there's no reason why people shouldn't have a forum ongoing. Yeah, thank you. And the final question um, is to James. Thank you, Ross. Um, and it concerns another difficult question, which is uh, the building names protocols currently in place at the university, which Barry prefaced beautifully in his uh, narrative. Um, and we know that this is a significant issue among students and staff. So your question from the research, what are the issues associated with many of the university's buildings' names? And given the urgency felt by the students, what are some next steps? What, what are some models for change look like? Hmm. Well, I, I, I agree with you it's an urgent issue and that it is something that uh, is a really uh, heated issue, actually, for a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, our study has shown that, that these, these discussions have been going now for 30, 40 years. So timely is, time is of the essence, perhaps you might say, at that point, um, because these, these, are, these are ongoing concerns that haven't been resolved, um, that haven't, there's no settlement that's been achieved. Um, so I think that's, you know, it, it, it comes down to the question of how challenging truth-telling is, actually. Yes. And it comes back to those larger themes about responsibility as well and about belonging and, and people involved in, in the university. So all of our speakers have, have, have talked around this, this question. I mean, a confession. When I began this work and I would look at the building names and I would read the published record on many of these individuals, I would see only what was published and I thought, this, what an amazing group of people, how extraordinary they are. And then you would have discussions or you'd be at a conference and you'd talk to someone and they'd say, but by the way, did you know that so-and-so was also a uh, eugenicist? And you would think, how, would, how is this not part of our narrative? How is this not part of our story? It feels, having done work on this project, that the way we tell stories, our histories of, of universities, is, is rather has been small and that we need to enlarge that picture. And it needs to become um, more nuanced, more difficult. It's something that we need to think a lot harder about, what it means for a person to have their, uh, their intellectual legacy challenged, how we do justice by those people after whom we've named buildings. I think that part of me wants to say that someone um, like Baldwin Spencer, whom you alluded to before, would recoil from anyone trying to smooth over or, or neaten up their own legacy. There's nothing, yes. nothing in their own intellectual work that is like that. They didn't rise to become an internationally regarded professor by, uh, by platitudes and, and papering over the edges. So part of the work that this book, this, this project, this larger project, which is partly the book and partly the uh, the, the, the centres that uh, Margot alluded to in her introduction earlier 
is aiming to do is, is to, to enlarge and complicate our story of the university's history so that there's space in it for saying that people were extraordinary individuals, that they contributed this, um, and that they also uh, undertook activities and argued uh, for things that we now utterly reject and repudiate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of, part of the challenge of this and part of actually what this, this truth-telling exercise is aiming to do, I think, is to enlarge our picture. Not to highlight different things, but to enlarge it, to, see, to step back a little bit further. And I think that is, on a good day, that's what this project will achieve. Um, your question was much more purposeful, though. It was about what, <laughs> what can be done. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I think I argue for in the chapter that I have in the forthcoming book on naming is to separate. I think it, it's, it helps to separate discussion about an individual's legacy and their work from the question of the building and the building name. And those, both of those things are actually historically located. They're, they're bound in their own narrative. So a person lives their life, they have their career, they get all their fellowships of the Royal Society and so forth. But then the, the decision to name a person also has a history and we need to understand that history as well. So a figure like Baldwin Spencer, we, we shouldn't make it about individuals, but a figure like Baldwin Spencer has the building named for him just before Barry arrives, almost in preparation perhaps, for Barry to walk in the door. Um, but Baldwin Spencer died in the 1920s. Um, so it's, it's a decision made by the university to reach back and try and connect with its history in our, in our living memory. And it's a much more recent decision. So I think that understanding that process, that heritage process, that decision about the university, why it named buildings, how it went about deciding on Baldwin Spencer, for example, I mean, we shouldn't, how, how, we, how we, it went about selecting individuals after whom to name buildings um, will help us to unpick this, this problem that I feel sometimes the university feels itself sort of stitched into a bit. Mm. Um, so, in fact, from my work, what the university needs to do what the university needs to do. <laughs> yes, we are right. the university. Yeah, what we need to what do. We, what we yes. need to do, what might happen, what might be a, a good approach, uh, <laughs> might be to um, implement some of the same procedures that was, were implemented initially. And that is you uh, conduct a historical appraisal of an individual and whether they warrant, whether they inspire students and so forth to consult with building users and the people who use the premises every day about whom they might like the building to be named after, which was done in the first place. We need to do that again. But I think that in the spirit of this truth-telling project, those need to be more searching questions. They need to be larger questions and we need to sit with it. But when I, when I say we need to sit with it, we need to sit with that complexity and understand where we stand with regard to that, because no person is it. Well, none of, none of the people after building to name are saints. Um, and we need to be ready to think about how, how that complexity can be incorporated or whether an individual becomes ineligible. Because I think, in my, in my interpretation, people can be great researchers, they can be extraordinary teachers, they can uh, raise funds for buildings and they can become figures of national, international prominence and still be ineligible to have a building named after them. Mm. And we need to sit with that. And the final thing I'd say is that once we've made that decision, that, hasn't, that has, can't be where it ends. So we need to explain why we have changed the building name. We need to explain that complexity in a way that is tricky to do. And we need to talk about it because after all, it's a wonderful thing, I think, that this university is, is bestowed with so many names of interesting people. We need to make more of that. We need to have more discussions, use these people and their legacies as ways of understanding our past, uh, the place, our place in the world, um, and uh, what we value and how that changes. Mm -hmm. So 
it needs to be incorporated into this this larger project amorphously defined. Yeah. Thank you. I've taken the yeah, notes. We've just, got the four sorry. steps here. Can I add something to that, please? Please. Um, I think the fact that this is a conversation that's been going on, as you say, James, for about 30 or 40 years, yes. tells me that there have been powers within the university that perhaps have not necessarily prevented challenge, but around um, how we name buildings or how we remember people and honour people. But so it's not that there's a lack of challenge or discussion, but in 30 or 40 years there's been a lack of actual change. So I feel that we need not be fearful about um, going through this process that you've just articulated, James. Um, I mean, there's plenty of other universities, as we know, we're connected to colleagues at other universities and they go, oh, well, there's a problem, we just change it. But we don't do that here because we're... We're bound, we're stitched, you said, James, we're stitched to, to this. So I just wanted to, um, yeah, just reflect on what you were saying as well, that um, I don't understand why, we, why um, there is power that is fearful. Mm -hmm. Well, I think part, partly the... That's my experience of it. One answer to that is that this truth-telling project hasn't occurred yet. Yeah. And that... When, I mean, perhaps other panellists might join this conversation as well, but one of the things that we've observed in writing this is that there are, there are stories that just don't get told. They don't find their way into the narrative. The narrative of, of stories or biographies of individuals, uh, partly by wanting to focus on the main story that people want to tell, but partly potentially for reasons of deference or tact or something like that, they just exclude some parts of these stories. And so I think that individuals who aren't necessarily university historians could be forgiven for reacting when someone challenges a name um, that is of extraordinary, you know, extraordinary name. How could this person be called into, into question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what are we doing here? Uh, that is a... Um, that's an understandable reaction, but you know I, I think that that more work needs to be done. Is yeah. building on this project actually? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Can I just very quickly answer you too, Anala? Mm. Um, I think when you look back through all the naming of buildings and how extraordinarily recently some of them were named about people who were, you know, very active in the eugenics movement who were fascist sympathisers during the the thirties. I mean, Agar was praising German sterilisation in 1943, and there's a, there's a lecture theatre named after him. Um, when, you, when you look back in how the buildings were named, you realise that, that, that it was the history that had been written or not written mm. that informed the people who named the buildings. Mm -hmm. So you actually got a step, almost one step back. Sometimes they're the same people, but not much. The people who were giving names out were ignorant of what happened. The question is why was there this silence mm -hmm. in the historical record that, that didn't inform them? I mean, you, that's the, I think that's the, mm. the, at the root yeah. of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's a sort of institutional inertia. You know, mm. we didn't do anything wrong. You, we got the wrong information, you know, so mm. what do we do? A sort of confusion in a sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. There's some telling outcomes there. Be not fearful. I mean, that's beautiful. Um, call to action, uh, avoid deference um, and act. Uh, I think there's a, there's a call to action for us all, I think, to, to take the university forward in this respect. That um, concludes the formal part of our panel session. Um, and would you join us to thank our panellists? Now we'll open up the floor. I think we have time for a couple of questions. If we could just wait until a microphone is brought to you. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I find it interesting that the name of uh, Baldwin Spencer came up numerous times. And uh, Baldwin Spencer was, of course, an early Australian anthropologist. And it so happens to be that I'm an anthropologist, uh, although not in the vein of Baldwin Spencer. 
But back in uh, 1968, Kathleen Gow, a Marxist anthropologist, wrote an interesting article in Monthly Review titled Anthropology as the Child of Imperialism. So to what extent, I'll, I'll direct the question to Barry particularly, uh, since you worked in that building. To what extent was um, Baldwin Spencer a child of imperialism? And to what extent has the university, both in anthropology and other uh, disciplines, decolonized itself? Uh, well, I, I think uh, he was um, a, a man of his time and um, part of this uh, British uh, settler colonial imperial complex or whatever you want to call it. Um, he, of course, um, was was not only um, uh, writing about um, the native tribes of Central Australia, as he uh, called us, uh, but also, um, you know, for, uh, was part of a, a worldwide uh, trade in uh, cultural objects and materials. So, um, I think at Museum Victoria, there's a there's a sled or something over there from. St. Petersburg that was um, traded by him in return for some Central Australian objects. And uh, so the, <laughs> the things that he did back then um, continue to impact the present, of course, as these materials uh, get sent back to Australia from all around the world. And um, he's an interesting character, I think, in that uh, we don't actually have a an ongoing uh, partnership and engagement with Central Australia, but maybe we should, given um, that we have a cultural responsibility to that part of the country, uh, because he worked there. And um, his work with Frank Gillen, who was postmaster at Alice Springs, as we all know, really um, uh, created a template for how the world understood Indigenous peoples of Australia. So uh, in my mind, he's a significant uh, uh, thinker um, and um, it's not all bad. Uh, one of uh, our current PhD students um, who I uh, have a little bit of a role to do in his PhD studies, Joel Little, uh, is... Uh, using uh, the work of Spencer to reinstitute place names across Alice Springs. So these are very specific uh, local names for places uh, that Joel's uh, remapping using, uh, using the insights that Spencer came up with. Um, I don't think that this uh, project is, uh, is really about um, dismantling uh, colonialism or the imperial past, but it's it's perhaps reconfiguring uh, how we understand those things and ourselves as Australians, whether we're Indigenous or not. I think it's worth pointing out that, and this will be in the book, that Baldwin Ball, Ball Spencer, who who I was a big fan of many years ago, um, uh, and I've doing this book as he's gone further and further down in my estimation, unfortunately, but that's probably just my presentism. But um, that he was he he was very keen on forced separation of uh, of children from families because he thought that half caste children were more intelligent than full blood children because they had white you know blood in them. Point out. Yes, yeah. yes, sorry, I no, apologise. No, just in case anyone yes, was yeah, yeah, unsure, yeah, yeah. yeah that's um, And, good. you know, uh, so he, uh, he, he, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is that even though he said that some, some had characteristics which he admired, mostly they were like children. He writes this, and James and I talk about it in the book, mostly they were like children. But if you go to the student lectures in the 1890s in the magazines at Melbourne University, he describes the Horn exhibition. He said they would not have found any, any specimens except a few insects if the Indigenous people hadn't found them for them. And yet he made his international reputation on that sort of work without any acknowledgement of the, the science and skill of the people that he was using. And, of course, they paid them appalling, you know, they didn't pay them or they, they you know, it was a, a 
terrible, terrible in all, all sort of sense. So, so just to add, you know, that's part of the imperial project was to rob and steal, but not acknowledge. Uh, hello, my name is Saran, I'm visiting PhD. I had a quick question about the role of Indigenous-led activism. Um, I guess, what has the role of Indigenous-led activism been in advocating for truth-telling at the recognition um, at the university level? And what has kind of propelled the university's kind of current focus on reconciliation as a whole? Well, I think there's been um, activism from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people always and always here at the university in differing forms and our activism continues in differing forms. But as it relates more um, to this particular project, um, I mean, Ross and James, you're both involved more closely with the contributors, so maybe... Barry and James have talked about it. Well, Barry was there. You know, was I? Was I? I think that's right. I think, um, you know, we often separate the idea of being an academic or a student from being an activist. But um, my experience of everyone I've known here from an Indigenous background is they're, they're, you know, they're wearing at least two hats and everyone's been an activist in their own way. Um, not necessarily marching on the streets, um, but... Um, pushing things along, uh, often uh, very quietly, but significantly. So, you know, I, it's hard to single out individual people and we probably shouldn't because um, there are so many people who have played an activist role in getting us to where we are now uh, and this project. And uh, <laughs> I guess it, it probably goes back to the 1970s when the first Indigenous people were employed at this university as, as staff members to, um, to get things moving in the right direction in response to the 1967 referendum. So, you know, for m most of the history the, uh, of this place and its relationship to Indigenous people, uh, it was... Uh, it was a relationship where Indigenous people were the objects of research. Um, they weren't, uh, I guess, living Indigenous people were not seen as that important and certainly weren't employed or um, enrolled here as um, students, uh, mostly until um, post-67. We, we do have... Um, on the record, um, Margaret Williams Weir as the first student at any university in Australia in the 1950s. But um, post-67, uh, everyone with a relationship with the university, uh, regardless of whether they've been staff, student, um, uh, professional staff or academic, has been an activist in some way. Um, and we wouldn't be here without uh, their hard work and dedication and, um, you know, it's probably cost them years off their lives, mm -hmm. to be honest, yeah. uh, just to keep on pushing yeah. uh, in this direction, which mm. is the right direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I said I wasn't going to mention any names, but I will. Eleanor Burke, um, uh, here in the 1970s, um, uh, Lisa Belair, who I worked with um, in the 1990s and was a great um, advocate for Indigenous students in particular. Uh, and uh, more recently, Marcia Langton, who remains here, and um, Ian Anderson. Um, all of these people have made a, a huge contribution to this institution. Mm -hmm. And... Um, by being here, uh, the progress has been made because uh, if you're on campus, uh, you know, you can ring up the VC and ask for a meeting. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> they don't have to give you one. but <clears throat> No, uh, you can ask. You can ask. Yeah. And right. to identify yourself as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person is a political act. And when you identify yourself as such, 
um, too bad for everyone else. It's a political act to identify and I, I would want each individual and group of people within our community to feel supported and empowered to enact the activism however in however form it comes. Like Barry said, it doesn't have to be in a rally in the street. Sometimes it's at a, a meeting table, you know, with, with other colleagues where you enact your activism. Yeah. Yeah. I'd also though, reach back before staff and students at the university. Students are also connecting with Indigenous activists in the community. And um, that is actually something that student activists at this university are trying to bring in Indigenous students uh, from the 1950s onwards. It's a slow process and it involves, it involves a lot of uh, uh, changing of minds, a lot of consciousness raising. You read the, the student press in the, in the 1950s and 60s and you see, uh, you see the, the public lectures and you see that Doug Nichols has come in again to give a talk or whatever. But then you also see casual racism and asides and terrible cartoons and things. So it's a slow process. And it's certainly not a story of, of, uh, of an awakening one day and then everything's fine. I, and I don't think uh, that everything's fine today either. It's, mm -hmm. it, but this is, this, is, this is how this history is told, is that it's, it's, it's uh, efforts in places, but also, you know, we fall down in so many others as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Mm. We're inside this institution that is a very slow moving, slow to make changes space. And when we invite our young students in here to be activists, they get very burnt out by the fact that it's such a slow. Um, even the renaming of buildings, this was a target of the Reconciliation Action Plan from 2018 to 2022 to have buildings renamed. It has not been done, but we're just hearing as the complications around why it hasn't been done. But have we been transparent? Do our students currently know that journey that we've taken? Or do we have to wait for another hopefully funded um, working group to take this project somewhere else before we even hear that story? What can we be doing in the moment? I know our students, um, there's no trust left in the government. There's no trust left in the media. And if we can't build trust here, then when do our, where do our students have to turn for for hope? We need to actually take this somewhere and not just sit on this and keep this as a live conversation going on. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for coming today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'd love to hear more um, and progress this conversation further. Mm -hmm. So please connect with us. Thank you. Thank you.